Hey there, photographers, Brenda Petrell here, and welcome to Outdoor Photography School, where we help you create better images and reconnect with nature. Today, I finally have a chance to spend some time hiking with my camera, and we have a gorgeous summer day here in Vermont today, and I'm super excited to get out. And I've decided to use this opportunity to scout out a location as a potential spot to photograph the Perseids meteor shower, which will peak next week on August 11th. And I thought I would share with you my process for scouting a location, as well as going over some guidelines about gear, safety, and camera settings for meteor showers, whether or not you catch the Perseids. The first step to planning a meteor shower image is to research when and where the meteor shower will be visible. And I'll link to a few resources in the description below that give information about popular meteor showers and when they occur. The peak night is the night when the most meteors per hour will be seen, and this is based on a few different things, including how high the meteor shower radiant will be in the sky that night, the phase of the moon, and the time the moon will rise. So for instance, if the moon rises later in the night, then you'll have more time without the moonlight to photograph the meteors. Usually a couple of nights before and after the peak night are also great for viewing and photographing the meteors. So if the weather doesn't work out for the peak night, do not fret. The radiant of a meteor shower is simply the area of the sky where the meteors appear to emanate from. It's usually near a constellation and that's usually how meteor showers are named. So for example, the Perseids are named after the constellation Perseus. If you want to create a composite image where several meteors appear to radiate from a single location, then you would need to compose your image to include the radiant. However, if you want to try to get long meteor tails, then it's best to photograph the sky opposite of the radiant. Of course, you'll see meteors all over the sky during a shower, so unless you're trying for one of these two scenarios, then it really doesn't matter which direction you point your camera. The Perseus constellation is found in the northeastern sky, but it can be kind of difficult to find because it's pretty faint. And a little trick for finding the Perseids radiant is to first spot the Cassiopeia constellation, which looks like a W or an M, depending on your location and the time of year. Cassiopeia also marks the northeastern part of the Milky Way, so if you spot either of these once your eyes have adjusted to the dark, you should be able to estimate where the Perseids radiant is, and it should be just below and slightly to the left of Cassiopeia. When you're looking for a potential location, you want to try to avoid light pollution as much as possible. And there are many online light pollution maps that you can check out, and I'll put a link in the description below for one or two to reference. The location that I have in mind is a spot that I've been to many times before, but I haven't been to in several years. It's actually along the Appalachian Trail on the way to Smarts Mountain in New Hampshire, and it's a hike that I used to do regularly with my lab, Kaya, before she got too old to do it. And as many of you know, she's since passed away and I've since had knee surgery. And so I'm eager to get back out on this trail, both for sentimental reasons, as well as a way to test out my knee. Also, I recall from my previous times there that there is a view to the Northeast and I'm curious to see whether that view could make a good composition for the Perseids meteor shower. So before we hit the trail, let's briefly review some camera gear and safety. So to photograph the night sky, it's best to use a DSLR or mirrorless camera that has good ISO capability. Because we're trying to capture the light of the stars, which are very faint, we need to really crank up the ISO to levels like around 1600 to 6400. It's also good to use a fast wide angle lens, and that means a lens that has a wide field of view, like 14 to 35 millimeters, so that you can capture as much of the sky as possible, and a wide aperture such as f2.8 or wider, which would be represented by a lower f-stop number. We'll dive into camera settings more later, but typically you would need to use long shutter speeds for night sky photography. And so a sturdy tripod and ball head is a must. And if you can't afford a hefty tripod, then at least look for one that has a hook in the center so that you can hang your camera bag or some other heavy item from it to reduce vibration of the tripod. To further reduce vibration, you can either use the built-in timer delay of your camera or you can also use a remote shutter release cable and you can 
remote trigger the shutter. I also recommend using an L bracket because this way it is super easy and secure to orient your composition either landscape or portrait mode rather than having your ball head tipped over 90 degrees which can make the tripod pretty unstable. Also it's a good idea to bring lots of extra charge batteries if you're planning to do photography all night or even a time lapse. I also bring along a little rain cover for my camera to help prevent dew formation and I also use these disposable hand warmers around the lens to keep dew from forming on the end of the lens. Now there are USB powered lens warmers that you can buy, but I find that this works just fine. Okay, let's quickly talk about safety on the trail. So I recommend that you scout your location during the day because it's so much easier and safer to assess the trail and any potential dangers like a fallen tree, that you may have to navigate around or loose rocks and ice or a cliff or whatever. It's just a good idea to identify these ahead of time so that you can be prepared for when you go out at night. So anytime you go out on trail, especially if you're going alone, it's a good idea to let somebody know what your trail plan is, where you're hiking, and when you expect to return. Also, make sure to bring along a map of the area and a compass in case you get lost, you can try to figure out how to get back. I always also pack a headlamp even if I expect to be back before dark because sometimes the hike can take longer than you expect and it's just great to have a light source in case you need it. I also bring along a small first aid kit, some bug and tick spray, and this one contains picardin which is supposed to be safe for both skin and clothing. I also will bring along a whole liter of water and I'll keep some extra water in my truck for when I return from the trail. I also like to bring a lightweight but calorie dust snack like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or some dried fruit and nuts, depending on how long I'll be on the trail. I also bring along a bear bell since this area is known to be home to black bears and the bell lets them know that I'm in the area. So I just attach it to my pack. You could also sing or whistle, but the, the main point is that it's better to alert the wild animals of your presence rather than startle them. I also bring along a little pocket knife, which can come in handy for numerous things. And this one is just very small and lightweight and can fit in my pocket. Now it's the middle of summer here and quite hot. So I'm only wearing a wicking t-shirt and shorts, but I'm bringing along a lightweight, long sleeve, quick dry shirt, as well as a very lightweight rain jacket. Now no rain is predicted for today, but you never know once you get up to the higher elevations. Okay, so it's time to pack up, hit the road, talk about camera settings and see what we find at the location. branch that's right smack in the middle of the trail and if you were doing this at night it'd be really easy to lose track of where the trail actually was from this so these are the types of things that are good to note when you're out scoping and scouting for a potential location Okay, so Atticus and I are gonna take a little breather at the first little lookout spot here because we're both fairly out of shape. <laughs> and uh, this hike is 
a lot more intense than I remember it from several years ago and I'm more out of shape than I used to be. So anyways, I'm going to take this moment to talk about settings. So earlier in the video, I had talked about how you want to be choosing a DSLR or mirrorless camera that has the capability of shooting at high ISO settings. And the ISO settings that you typically use for night sky photography, whether it's Milky Way photography, uh, star trails or meteors, is around ISO 1600 would probably be the lowest you would go up to 6400 depending on your camera and how well it handles noise at the high ISO settings. The best way to account for noise is to either stack the images in post-processing where you blend a bunch of images together to basically average out the noise or you can use a star tracker. The next setting is aperture and you want it to be at least f2.8 ideally. Anything above that, like 3.5 or above, it's really hard to get your ISO to a place where you're not just getting a ton of noise in the image. So ideally you would be at f2.8 or wider. And then lastly is the shutter speed. With the shutter speed, the goal is to leave the shutter open long enough that you capture enough light to see the stars, but not so long that you get star trails. And what it depends on is the focal length of your lens. So the shorter the focal length of the lens, the less movement of the sky you'll detect and the more zoomed in your lens is, if you're using more of a telephoto lens, then you're going to capture the movement or the rotation of the stars uh, as they move through the night. So the way you figured this out is you can start with the 500 rule, which is not that accurate, but it is a good starting point. All you have to do is take 500, divide it by the focal length of your lens. So say for instance, I wanna use a 24 millimeter lens, then I would take 500 because that's the number you would use for a full frame camera. So 500 divided by the focal length of the lens, which would be 24 millimeters, is equal to around 20 seconds. So that would be the starting shutter speed that I would use for my meteor showers. And with meteor showers, using longer shutter speeds is kind of advantageous because then you might capture more of the tail of the meteor. However, then the stars may also um, tail just a little bit. And so you don't wanna go longer than whatever number you get from the 500 rule, but you can always go shorter and increase your ISO a little bit if that helps you with your exposure settings. If you're on a crop sensor camera, then you would use 330 divided by the focal length of the lens. Okay, so the rest is over. Let's keep on hiking. All right, well, here we are to the second lookout. And I don't know if you can see, but I'll try zooming in here. These are new. I don't know if you can see them, but there are windmills on the horizon there. They were not here the last time I was up here many years ago. So that could potentially ruin the image because sometimes they have lights that blink at night. And I don't know that I necessarily want blinking lights in my image, but it's all part of the story, I suppose. So what I'm gonna do now is take out my compass and see, because I think that Northeast is over here. That's my guess but I could be completely wrong. So let's take a look. Okay, so I've looked at my compass here on my phone and I can see that the direction that I think is Northeast is actually is Northeast. I was right, so that was good. So anyway, what I'm going to do now is use the PhotoPills app, which has an augmented reality where I can see where the radiant for the Perseids meteor shower is supposed to be on the date and time that I wanna be here. So that's a cool thing about PhotoPills. And if, if you're unfamiliar with the app, I'm doing a whole series on how to use PhotoPills called PhotoPills Friday. I will link it in the description below uh, if you wanna check it out. I just recently did uh, a whole video on how to use the augmented reality feature as well as how to use a tool that they have specifically for planning meteor shower images. Anyway, so let's just click over there right now quickly and I'll show you what I mean. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into the planner and I'm going to click on the little plus sign and I'm going to click on that first icon there in the map icons bar. And that's just going to place the red pin at my current location on this rock, on this trail. I've already loaded up the Perseids meteor shower into the app. And all I have to do is click on night AR. And now I should be able to see 
where the radiant will be in the sky. And I can scroll forward and backward in order to see how it moves throughout the night. And sure enough, um, it looks like the Perseids are going to be over here. I thought they might be over here, uh, but instead they're over there. So it's a little closer to the edge of the tree line here than I had hoped. But maybe if we go up a little further, uh, we'll find a better vantage point. I don't know. I can also see where the Milky Way is. So for instance, if I wanted to set up two shots, then I could have one camera facing northeast and have that run on a time lapse. And then if I follow the augmented reality and look at the Milky Way, I can look at it through the sky and I can see that the southern part of the Milky Way, the galactic core, will be in this direction. So technically I could be shooting that way. This doesn't make a very good composition, so I don't think I would do that from this exact spot, but that's sort of what I'm thinking about. All right, so why don't we keep on going and see if we get anything that's better. So we made it to our lookout spot and this is Smarts Mountain. What I would like ideally is for the Perseid radiant to be above the mountain. So what I'm going to do is go back into the Photopills app. I have now reset the red pin for our current location because I had set it for where we were about a mile back. And now I'm going to activate the night augmented reality. And again, I have the date set for August 11th, which is the peak of the Perseids. I think it's an okay composition. I, I wouldn't say that it's fantastic uh, because the moon is going to be peaking up around the peak just as the Perseids radiant is going to be coming in into the center of the mountain. So, but I think I would like to try it anyway. Now I say that and I have a toddler at home. So who knows if I'll be able to get out here on August 11th or if even if the skies would be clear, but I would like to think that I could try. So sorry for the heavy breathing from the dog. <laughs> that is all for today. I think that I'm just going to enjoy the beautiful light on the mountain and take some images and I'll share with you whatever I find. Thanks for watching.